The Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution, known primarily for prohibiting cruel and unusual punishment, also precludes the imposition of excessive bail. It says, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. Stories of people held on seemingly excessive multi-million dollar bonds have sparked the question, how much bail is too much? For example, music mogul Suge Knight was held on $25 million bond when accused of running over two people. Despite the fact that the Eighth Amendment has been around for over 225 years, there have been few Supreme Court rulings on the issue of how much bail is too much. In this presentation, we'll examine the history of some of the primary cases dealing with this question and provide some of the practical implications of excessive bail. Excessive bail is a hurdle faced not only by people who are very wealthy, but especially by people who are impoverished. Impoverished defendants often remain in prison while awaiting trial because even minimum bonds exceed their financial resources. Because they're detained pending the trial, the state has to incur these detention costs because they can't get out on bail. The resulting burden on the state and the taxpayers constitutes another factor in determining how much bail is too much. Not only do we have to worry about the Eighth Amendment and determining what is constitutionally considered excessive bail, we also have to factor in the costs of detaining people pending their trials. The excessive bail clause in the Constitution is implemented at the federal level through the Bail Reform Act of 1966 and subsequent amendments to that act. The statute requires a judicial officer to hold a hearing on the conditions, if any, for the release of a defendant awaiting trial. The judicial officer must release a defendant on personal recognizance, in other words, without any bail, unless a hearing shows that such release will not reasonably assure the appearance of the person as required or will endanger the safety of any other person in the community. If the hearing shows otherwise, the judicial officer is required to impose the least restrictive conditions that will assure the defendant's presence in court and the public safety. The posting of a financial bond is but one of the conditions that can be imposed. The other conditions can require the defendant to remain in a specific person's custody, seek or maintain employment or schooling, comply with residential or travel restrictions, avoid contact with the victims, potential witnesses, or others, not possess weapons, refrain from using illegal drugs or excessive use of alcohol, or undergo medical, psychological, psychiatric, or substance abuse treatment. A defendant can be detained without bail only upon a finding that no conditions would assure his or her appearance in court and public safety. The judicial officer is prohibited from imposing a financial condition that results in detention. In addition to these federal standards, all 50 states also provide for varying degrees of bail. The excessive bail clause is one of the least litigated provisions in the Bill of Rights, with only three cases from the Supreme Court of the United States directly addressing it. Those cases have focused on the issue of when bail can be denied, but have not otherwise definitively answered the question of what the clause means or when it applies. The court initially adopted a liberal approach to the clause in 1951 when it decided Stack v. Boyle. The defendants in Stack were charged with conspiracy to overthrow the government. They were held on $50,000 bond, which exceeded the amount usually imposed for offenses with similar penalties. The Supreme Court supported the defendant's motion to reduce the bond, emphasizing the role that bail plays in maintaining a fundamental freedom. That fundamental freedom is the traditional right to freedom before conviction, which permits the unhampered preparation of a defense and serves to prevent the infliction of punishment prior to conviction. Unless this right to bail before trial is preserved, the presumption of innocence would lose its meaning. The court found that the function of bail was to balance this right with an assurance that a defendant would stand trial and submit to sentence if found guilty. It held that bail set at a figure higher than an amount reasonably calculated to fulfill this purpose is excessive under the Eighth Amendment. The court reasoned that the bail imposed on the stack defendants did not fulfill this purpose because there was no evidence that the defendant was a flight risk. 
Therefore, such a high bail was not necessary to ensure their attendance at trial. However, the court narrowed its approach to bail little more than four months later in Carlson v. Landon. In Carlson, four alien communists were arrested pursuant to a law allowing for the deportation of foreign Communist Party members. They claimed that their detention without bond violated the excessive bail clause. This time, however, the court disagreed with their contention. It held that the excessive bail prohibition did not imply an absolute right to bail. Justice Reed wrote, the contention is also advanced that the Eighth Amendment compels the allowance of bail in a reasonable amount. The bail clause was lifted with slight changes from the English Bill of Rights. In England, that clause has never been thought to accord a right to bail in all cases, but merely to provide that bail shall not be excessive in those cases where it is proper to grant bail. The court reiterated this position 35 years later in United States v. Salerno. There, the defendants were charged with engaging in organized crime activities. The trial court denied bail, finding that the defendants would likely continue to engage in crimes that would endanger the community if they were released. The defendants argued that the Bail Reform Act provision authorizing this detention violated the excessive bail clause. Citing the Stack case, they claimed that the clause limited bail decisions to risk of flight considerations. The court again disagreed with the defendants' reliance on Stack for the proposition that bail should only serve to nullify the flight risk. The court held that flight risk is far too slender a read on which to rest. Citing Carlson, the court held that the excessive bail clause is not violated when bond is denied to promote other legitimate governmental interests. The court said that when Congress has mandated detention on the basis of a compelling interest other than the prevention of flight, as it is here, the Eighth Amendment does not require bail. The dearth of judicial guidance on how much bond is too much has created a bail crisis, filling local jails, impacting other parts of society, and not fulfilling bail's purpose. The resulting taxpayer burden has shifted the responsibility for who should answer this question from judges in courts to policymakers in state legislatures. The practical considerations of leaving the excessive bail question unanswered are numerous. The first is courts' inability to make meaningful bond determinations. Crowded court dockets result in abbreviated proceedings, with most taking only minutes. Absent guidance on the excessive bail question, judges efficiently decide cases by quickly imposing cash bonds in amounts they consider to be customary for the charged offense. Little consideration is given to alternatives or to the defendant's ability to pay. Consequently, many defendants held for minor offenses remain incarcerated until trial or plead guilty in order to be released because they can't afford even minimum bonds. By the end of 2015, almost two-thirds of jail inmates were being held without a conviction. The second practical consideration of indecision on this issue relates to the first. The judiciary's summary style of imposition of bonds is not fulfilling the baseline goal of assuring a defendant's appearance in court. Rising bail amounts have not caused the failure to appear rate to decrease. A third practical implication of this failure is the cost it imposes on others. Indigents, who cannot afford to pay bonds, sometimes lose jobs, impacting family members and employers who rely on them. When an indigent person can come up with money to post bond, the money often comes at the expense of funds needed for family living expenses. These first three have created a fourth practical implication, a cost to taxpayers and a shift on who is focusing on answering the question. Pre-trial incarceration costs have pushed policymakers to assume a responsibility for resolving the excessive bail issue. In one case, for example, in Cook County, Illinois, a single offender cost taxpayers $4,000 for a 28-day stay in jail after reportedly stealing a $4.58 meal. Illinois legislatures responded by creating an accelerated resolution program, sometimes called the Rocket Docket. It requires courts to try defendants charged with certain minor offenses within a 30-day period or release them on personal recognizance, which is a pretrial release without bail on the basis of a promise by the defendants to return to court. Additionally, Cook County's state attorney 
no longer opposes the releases of pretrial defendants who cannot pay bonds of $1,000 or less. Elected officials in California and New Jersey, for example, have also monitored the activity in states like Illinois and are among other places in the process of reforming their bail systems through the state legislature. Failure to fully define the excessive bail clause's fundamental rights has a wide-reaching series of consequences for government at all levels. The breadth and significance of those implications makes it likely that the question of when is bail too much will be answered soon, and not necessarily by the courts, but by state and federal lawmakers.